Well, thank you all for coming out on a Sunday. It's great to see everybody here. And for those who are listening uh, at home, thank you for, uh, for tuning in. We're now just uh, two weeks away from Election Day, a real important election for federal races and state races. Um, I just had the opportunity this weekend to give the uh, National Republican Weekly Address, which is done every week in response to the President's uh, weekly radio address. And the main theme of what we had to say was with regards to how I believe our country can do better. I do believe that our country could be heading in a better direction than we are right now. Uh, I have uh, some priorities I've been talking about during this campaign. We've had many Meet the Candidate events and debates where we have an opportunity to debate where we stand on issues. I believe that our country can do a better job growing our economy and creating more good paying private sector jobs. We could do a better job fighting for our veterans who fought for us. I believe that we could do a better job securing our borders and America's interests abroad. I'm someone who is strongly in favor of improving our nation's health care. I believe that Obamacare has resulted in higher premiums and deductibles, lost policies, lost doctors, longer wait times. We can do better. I also believe in higher standards for our kids but I don't believe that Common Core is the answer. My background, um, I currently serve as a major in the Army Reserves and as a New York State Senator. I grew up, born and raised on Long Island, went to college and law school in Albany where I did Army ROTC. Spent four years on active duty. Uh, I spent some time in Iraq uh, in 2006 with the 82nd Airborne Division. I was a military intelligence officer, a prosecutor, and a magistrate. I got off active duty in 2007, that's when I joined the reserves where I still serve today. I'm married, uh, my wife Diana, we have identical girls, they just turned eight years old, Michaela and Ariana. They were actually less than a pound and a half when they were born. They were uh, um, 14 and a half weeks early and they're doing great. The main different challenges in life give you perspective, sometimes it's at home with family, sometimes it's professionally. For me, uh, whether it's the family or my time in the military or serving the state senate, uh, I have had the opportunity to uh, develop these a perspective on how things are going in Washington uh, and with our state and with our local community. And I'm convinced that we could be on a better path than what we are on right now. The incumbent and I uh, get along well personally. Our offices have worked well together. Uh, we just disagree on important, substantive ways to move our country forward. So that's why we're here, to, uh, to be able to introduce ourselves, to be able to answer, answer your questions. There is no better way to ask for someone's vote than to do it in person. We're both here for the, uh, the same reason. I would uh, be very grateful for your support on Tuesday, November 4th. Um, would you like to ask your question of uh, the congressman, or do you want to wait until he speaks? Okay. <coughs> well, good afternoon to all of you, and thank you for coming out. This is a, a right of fall, and uh, I look forward to it every year, although I missed it uh, in 2012 because uh, the day of the uh, Meet the Candidates in 2012 was the day that Sandy hit. I don't know how many of you remember that, but I was in full-time uh, storm uh, storm response mode, uh, so I was not able to be here. Um, as you know, I've been the incumbent congressman now for 12 years. I'm very proud of that, and I'm very proud of the service that I and my office have provided to the people of this district. And I'll just talk about two things uh, in the five minutes that I have. The first is uh, that area to which I and my staff have dedicated our service, and that is to deal with each individual person and the problems and the needs that they present to us uh, over the course of the 12 years that we've been here. We call it constituent service and we do it extremely well. And I have satisfactorily closed over 17,000 cases. Uh, and that's 17,000 lives affected, that's 17,000 problems solved, that's 17,000 times that the federal government came to the table to help deal with a specific issue. And whether it's interceding uh, with a large bank uh, to make sure that the mortgage foreclosure uh, process uh, that uh, my constituent felt was being imposed on them unfairly was brought to a halt and they were given an opportunity to refinance their mortgage 
or whether it was interceding with an insurance company that refused to cover a particular prescriptive medicine that an individual needed, frankly, to stay alive, uh, or whether it is dealing with a veteran uh, who was unable to get the coverage, uh, pardon me, get the disability rating uh, that they had earned as a result of their service, and as a consequence were not receiving the appropriate compensation uh, from the VA. We had one case in which a, uh, a guy came to us and he was about to lose his home, he was about to lose his car, and his wife was about to walk out on him. Um, in three weeks, we turned it around. Three weeks, we got him a back check for $9,000. We got him a monthly disability rating and check uh, that was more appropriate for his condition, and he turned his whole life around. That's good work. That's the government doing what it does best, and that's our office doing what we do each and every day. Uh, second thing I want to talk about is, um, and I want to give it specific reference uh, to Montauk. Um, the other thing that I've worked very hard on in partnership with my colleagues in government, uh, other levels of government, is to bring the federal government to the table uh, in ways that are very helpful to local government. And I'll just talk about two. Uh, I think it was three years ago um, that Lake Montauk Harbor had shoaled in such that um, uh, the commercial fishing fleet was having a hard time getting in and out. Uh, and frankly, the Coast Guard vessels were having a hard time getting in and out. And then uh, town supervisor, Bill Wilkinson, came to me, asked me what I could do. Now, Lake Montauk Harbor was not scheduled for a dredge from the Corps for years out into the future. But I went to work on it, and I literally went right to the top. I went right to the Assistant Secretary of the Army for Civil Works, the number one person in the Army Corps of Engineers. And I said, I simply have to have this. I have to have a dredge. Of, of Lake Montauk Harbor or else the largest fishing port in the state of New York is going to shut down and our ability to provide uh, rescue uh, and other services from the Coast Guard is going to be impaired. We got it done. Worked with Fred Thiel on that uh, and we got it done. Uh, and I'm proud of that. And I will also tell you that's not something a rookie could get done. I was able to get it done because I had a relationship uh, with uh, the, under, the Assistant Secretary, Joe Allen Darcy, and we were able to pull it off. And the second is what's going to happen here late in 2014, and that's the, uh, the beach nourishment project in the area of downtown Montauk. Now, downtown Montauk has been in need of beach nourishment and dune realignment for a long, long time. Uh, and uh, again, I partnered with Fred Thiel and with Jay Schneiderman and Ken Laval, uh, and we went after the Corps big time. And we told the Corps that we absolutely had to have a project. We told them that it could not wait. Uh, until the full implementation of what's called the FIM project, the Fire Island of Montauk Point project. And guess what? We won. Now, the project as originally designed was a project that none of us felt we could live with because it was designed uh, to have a revetment. And um, uh, my own personal view, and I was a history major, not a coastal geologist, but my own personal view um, is that hard structures on beaches don't work. Um, so, but what we did, <clears throat> what Fred, particularly Fred and I did, is we engaged the environmental community and we engaged the core and we came up with what we think is a workable compromise, which is geotubes uh, covered by sand. And that project is a $9 million project, fully paid for by the federal government. It's going to begin, as I say, late December, we believe, uh, and it's going to provide the kind of interim beach protection that this community needs. Uh, and then it will be followed by the larger FIM project, probably in calendar. 16. So I'm sorry, please wrap up. I will please wrap up. Uh, but I, uh, I too, uh, am, uh, uh, I'm here to ask for your vote. Uh, I believe I've earned your vote, uh, and I'm hopeful of, of receiving your vote as I have in the past. Thank you all very much. Thank you. Um, Mr. Zeldin, would you like to ask a question of your opponent? Uh, if you could just identify the, the top three priorities to change federal law to reduce the cost to do business here on Long Island for employers. Good question. Um, I think there are a couple. I think that one, we need to have a zero-based assessment of all of the different regulations that impact businesses as they, as they conduct their business and as they try to seek new businesses. Uh, that that zero-based um, assessment, by the way, uh, is underway, uh, and I am hopeful that we'll get to the point 
uh, where we will have a reasonable balance between the regulatory environment uh, and and uh, what people often say, which is government would it would do best for businesses if they got out of the way. And I would suggest to you that that's a fallacious thinking uh, based on two things. Um, I always look at the Clean Water Act. Before the Clean Water Act was passed, only 30% of our nation's waters were either swimmable or fishable. After the passage of the Clean Water Act, we're at 70%. And that's a good thing. And it would not have happened without government regulation. But what we need to do is find regulations that work and do away with the regulations that don't work. I think the other thing that we need to do uh, is make sure that the Small Business Administration is as supportive as it possibly can be of small businesses. Uh, and, uh, and sometimes that works. They have, they have various loan programs and various planning programs that work. Uh, but other times they're not as supportive or as helpful as they should be. And then the third thing I think we need to do uh, is make sure that our businesses have an educated workforce. And it is why I have worked as hard as I have to ensure access uh, to higher education. It's why I've worked as hard as I have to make sure that there's access to, uh, to job training. Uh, and uh, I have particularly focused on the STEM professions. Long Island's economy has moved from a manufacturing-based economy to really more of a scientific and, uh, and uh, um, um, engineering and, and technology-based economy. Uh, and we need to have a workforce that does that. And I go around our district and I ask people what their biggest problem is, what they tell me more often than anything, any other thing is that they, they, have, they don't have the access they need to have to an educated workforce. So I think education is absolutely crucial. I've spent my entire adult life in education, and that's something that I focus on. Mike, my, my question for Mr. Zeldin is this. Um, this area, um, first congressional district, and as you move further east, this, what I'm about to say is more so the case, uh, is one of the more environmentally precious uh, and environmentally imperiled areas that we have. Now, the, um, there's a group in New York called EPA, EPI Environmental Advocates. They just released their scorecard. Scores were from 40 to 105. Mr. Zeldin's score was a 50. Uh, in contrast, Mr. Thiel's score was 100. Uh, and so this is an area that's used to being represented by people who put the environment uh, at, the, at the, the top of their priority list. And so my question to you, Lee, is um, what, how do you justify having a score of 50 when the top score is 105 and what would you say to the people of this region who are very concerned about the environment in terms of assuaging their concerns that you're not going to care about the environment as much as others do? You know the environmental advocates uh, have actually held it against me they introduced legislation to repeal the MTA payroll tax they scored that against me uh, they scored it against me that I have proposed eliminating the saltwater fishing license fee, which we were able to get rid of. We were able to get rid of the MTA payroll tax for 80% of employers. Um, so you know, when you get into the weeds as far as what uh, certain groups are scoring for or against, it should be noted that the environmental advocates uh, had, had scored against some of these really important priorities for the East End. So if I went back, it, you know, if I had another option of whether or not to propose repealing the MTA payroll tax, would I do it again? Yes, absolutely. If I had another chance to propose eliminating the saltwater fishing license fee, would I? Yeah, absolutely. So uh, you know, it's it's important uh, when you whether you're up in Albany or you're down in Washington that you are fighting for your constituents uh, as best as you can. The devil is always in the details. So, for example, I asked the question of the opponent of my opponent. You know, what are the three changes to federal law that would reduce the cost to do business? And when you replay his answer, we all agree that it's important to have an educated workforce. The question is, what change to federal policy would you make to reduce the cost to do business? We have employers who are, who are not surviving here. Look at the MTA payroll tax as an example. Look at the impact of the saltwater fishing license fee on, on charter fishing boats who had to, had to pay uh, on top of their high cost to operate their boat. The fact that, you know, that, that, that diesel is as high as it is, the taxes and the regulations. There are a lot of commercial and recreational fishermen who are struggling to get by right here on the east end of Long Island. Now just because there's some, there's some uh, group out there that wants to score against me representing my constituents, I'll tell you, I'll do it again and again and again. The reason why I asked my question 
of what are three changes to federal law to reduce the cost to do business is to hear exactly what the three changes are to federal law. So to say that, you know, the SBA, we need to look at what's working and what's not working. For employers, they want to know what changes are you going to make. So, or, you know, with regards to an educated workforce, it doesn't reduce the cost to do business. It does not create more good paying private sector jobs. Uh, but yes, that's, that, that, that is uh, some of the things that the environmental advocates have scored against me. Thank you. Uh, it's time for you folks to ask you questions. So, uh, yes. Uh, hi, my name is Alex Berg. Would you stand up? Oh, yeah, hi. Uh, my name is Alexander George Berg. Um, I operate a free kayak tour for veterans once a month, and I would be honored to have you come at some point. That being said, uh, would you increase funding for medical research? Who are you asking this question of? Not me, I hope. Senator Zeldin. <laughs> <laughs> what, what, what kind of medical research? Something specific or just general? Specifically medical research that would benefit society and not necessarily be profit oriented. Okay, but just you two generally. It's not like you have a specific project in mind. No. Just do I support funding medical research? Yeah. Sure. Increasing funding to medical research. <laughs> Absolutely. <laughs> okay. I, I'll give you an opportunity to ask a, a follow-up if you have a specific, I mean, the, an, the short answer is yes. I could just talk just to hear myself talk, but I'll give you <laughs> Okay, where would you get the money from? Well, so it's very important that, you know, so I mean, President Obama during his 2012 race, his, his slogan was forward, remember? Uh, Manchester, New Hampshire, he was debuting his slogan of forward. And he had a big crowd there, and he said, um, you know, we need to invest in bridges and roads. Um, you know, the, the Mitt Romney and the Republicans don't, they want to go backwards, we want to go forward. And we need to invest in education. And, you know, everything he said, one thing after another, it sounded good to everybody. Republicans, Democrats, liberals, conservatives. And unfortunately, by the way, how much time do we have to answer this? Another half, another 30 seconds. Another 30 seconds, gosh, that shortens my story. Um, and you know, you're listening, and it sounded good. Um, and and, and but all, all that I was asking as I was listening to it was how you're gonna pay for it. And I think it's, it's important to be able to fund these important projects. Uh, on, you know, unfortunately, sometimes it comes across as lacking compassion because you just ask, how are we gonna pay for it? Um, but we, you know, federal government's passed one budget since 2007. And I don't blame Republicans or Democrats. I, I blame all of them. There's been one federal budget passed since 2007. So I think we should have annual budgets again uh, so that we can be looking at both sides of the ledger, revenues and expenses. Did you vote for the government shutdown? Uh, I'm, I'm sorry, I'm a state senator up in Albany. Did I, did, I didn't vote for the, the government shutdown. You had nothing to do with that? I'm, I'm, well, I'm, I'm, running for, I'm running against the incumbent, but I'm not actually in Congress right now. But, uh, but yes, I, I support did funding. You, did you support the Republicans voting for that? Sorry. You know, other people have questions. Too. Okay, anybody on this side of the room? Uh, yes. Yes. Hi, my name is Sue Avedon. I would like... Uh, I'm sorry, your name is what? Sue Avedon. I would like Mr. Bishop to talk a little bit about some of the work he's done on behalf of veterans. Yeah. Yeah. How, how much time do you have? <laughs> okay, uh, real quick, um, our, our constituent service work with respect to veterans, I would say, is second to none. Uh, we have helped hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of veterans. We do it very well, uh, and, um, and I'm very proud of that. Uh, legislatively, uh, my focus with respect to veterans has been on uh, dealing with the issue of exposure to toxic burn pits in Iraq and Afghanistan. It was an issue that nobody knew about, uh, but it is causing enormously difficult problems for thousands of our nation's veterans. I led the effort to get those burn pits banned. They are now banned. Iraq, hopefully we're not going back into. Afghanistan, they are banned. Uh, I then led the effort to create a registry for all of our troops who were exposed uh, to toxic burn pits so that they would be aware of the, of the uh, potential damage of their exposure uh, and, and uh, uh, be encouraged to seek evaluation and treatment. And now uh, I'm um, 
Uh, my principal legislative effort is to create us three centers of excellence for the evaluation, study, and research and treatment of burn pit related ailments and the Iraq and Afghanistan veterans of America have listed that bill as uh, among their top five legislative priorities for the Congress right now. Uh, I can do a lot more, but I only got two minutes. Thank you. Uh, yeah. Okay. Uh, I received a mail up from the Republican committee. It's troubling. It says Tim Bishop is threatening the safety of every New Yorker. What is your feeling on uh, national security and ISIS? And Senator Zeldin? Well, one qu why don't we have a one question at a time? Okay. Is that a question for me? Yeah. Um, I, I think, I, this, I, can we each have more than two minutes? It's a little hard. To, to, I think that Back of wood. Yeah. Okay. Um, I think ISIS is a serious, serious threat. I think we have to deal with it, but I think we have to recognize that we're not going to eliminate ISIS uh, militarily. Um, General Walsh was, uh, pardon me, General um, Dempsey, Chairman of the Joint Chiefs of Staff, was asked uh, what he would need to have in order to eliminate ISIS in 90 days. His answer was, "It can't be done." said it can't be done militarily uh, because uh, really it requires more of a political solution than a military solution. So my view is it's a serious threat. We have to deal with it, uh, but we should be dealing with it as we are now. Uh, but we need to bring the more moderate countries in the Middle East to the table uh, and, and use the, the forces that they have under their control uh, to, uh, to deal with ISIS on the ground. I think if this becomes yet another uh, war between the Christian West and the Muslim Middle East, we are going to find ourselves in the exact same quagmire we found ourselves in in Iraq, and we have found ourselves in in Afghanistan. This cannot be the U.S. against the the Muslim world. We cannot once again become the infidels, which is how we're perceived in the Muslim world. That particular mailer, uh, frankly, is insulting. Uh, we get used to this sort of thing, uh, but what it's based on is I um, I voted uh, to uh, that would in such a way that would allow. Uh, Guant Guantanamo uh, uh, detainees to be transferred. And here's the facts. It costs us $2.7 million per detainee. You ask where the money comes from. You can house a detainee in a federal, uh, pardon me, in a Department of Defense maximum security prison for $34,000. It's $450 million a year we're spending on Gitmo. And I personally do not want to take the position that I don't trust the United States military to be able to secure a prison. I have more respect for the United States military than that. I believe they can secure a prison. Uh, as I mentioned in the opening, there are certain issues that uh, you know, the incumbent and I just disagree on. I, I don't support closing Guantanamo Bay. Uh, he does. Um, you know, the president had negotiated uh, a release, an a prisoner exchange for uh, for Bo Bergdahl for five high-value, uh, dangerous targets in Guantanamo. I, I, I did not support that uh, that negotiation. I don't believe that we should be negotiating with, with terrorists. Um, that's that's my personal opinion with regards to the folks who are there in Guantanamo Bay. Um, with regards to ISIS, um, I, I think that the, the president's strategy may be successful at uh, killing some of the bad guys, um, disrupting some of their command and control, taking out some of their logistics, but it will not be successful at destroying ISIS. Uh, this is what, right after the president's speech on September 10th, uh, this was at my, my thought as I was listening to it, the statement that we put out that night, that's why I said it. Iraqi military and Iraqi law enforcement that the president is relying upon to destroy ISIS, uh, a lot of these people do not even show up to work. Um, I've met them, I, I served with them when I was over there in 2006. If they have a precinct that is a few hundred feet from their home, and they're in an area where they're expecting no threat that day, they do not show up. They do not fight for love of country. They do not fight for the flag or constitution or rule of law. Uh, they are there to get a paycheck, and when they are within harm's way, they lay down arms. That's why the U.S. Uh, went into Iraq so easily in 91. That's why the U.S. went into Iraq so easily in 2003. So, and the other thing too that I'm concerned about with uh, the president's speech is that 
he says that this is going to be different than past wars in Iraq and Afghanistan because there will be no boots on the ground. And in the same exact speech, he said he announced that he was sending 495 additional troops to Iraq. Uh, I, I, I had just a week and a half ago, I saw a picture of someone showed me of their grandchild um, in the Air Force in Baghdad on the ground wearing boots carrying a rifle. Um, we have men and women in harm's way right now over in Iraq. Um, I would love to have a little bit more clarity uh, from the president on his strategy, who the personnel is uh, over there now, uh, what their skill sets are, what their mission is, and who is in charge. Uh, it's important to have the right person uh, in charge on the ground um, with a whole lot more combat experience than you know, President Obama, with all due respect to him, or President Bush before him, or President Clinton before him. Uh, this isn't a knock uh, on any one particular person, but we have generals who have deployed several times, uh, who understand the Iraqi culture, the Iraqi government, the Iraqi military law enforcement, and they need to be, we all need to know who it is, who is in charge, and what their recommendations are, what their vision is to destroy ISIS, and then we can have a de debate of whether or not we want to give them the flexibility and resources to implement that vision to destroy ISIS. But I believe that we need to improve the president's strategy. After, I, that wasn't my question. Can I ask my question now, Mr. Zeldin? Well, let me get a few other. That's all right. You had like uh, slow down. You had one question. We'll come back. We'll come back to you. Not to worry. Um, yes, uh, the lady in the back. Yeah, uh, that's you. <laughs> yes, uh, Diana Walker. With all due respect, Senator Zeldin, you're not running for president yet. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> Would you mind coming back to us locally, specifically what uh, Congressperson Bishop asked? Without the environment being protected here, we don't have a tax base. We don't have tourists. We don't have real estate taxes. What bills have you sponsored in the state Senate that would protect the environment? Well, uh, I've actually had the opportunity to introduce several pieces of legislation that have been passed and signed into law up in Albany. So the Department of Environmental Conservation has a lot of their authority to, uh, to regulate many different fisheries, uh, all, all offshore, um, that, I, that carry what's called departmental bill. So the Commissioner of the Department of Environmental Conservation wants to help preserve um, our environment and our waterways and some of these fisheries so they come to the legislature and we have to pass a bill uh, I introduced many of those pieces of legislation uh, we also in securing a the repeal of the uh, saltwater fishing license fee it was a top priority to protect the conservation fund and the environmental protection fund so in that budget we actually in negotiating we uh, negotiating the elimination of the saltwater fishing license fee we protected the jobs to the Marine Bureau by taking funding out of the general fund and adding extra funding to the Marine Bureau. Uh, so the Marine Bureau actually was getting more money than they were uh, expecting through the, the proceeds of the solar fishing license fee. During my few years up in Albany, we were able to increase the Environmental Protection Fund. We were able to increase the, uh, the conservation fund uh, here in the, in the state of New York. Um, so those are some of the ways, but there's actually several different pieces of legislation uh, that I introduced working very closely with Departmental Envi Department of Environmental Conservation that were passed and signed into law to protect our waterways. Uh, yes, all the way in the back. Yeah. Yes, I am in the back. Sure. Uh, my name is Avis Goodman. Uh, my con uh, question is for uh, Congressman. Uh, you're a familiar face to many around here. Uh, you're a five term incumbent. Uh, can you help us understand? how you might approach your next term differently. What have you learned and how can you reassure us that a vote for you isn't a vote for the status quo, which frankly, Long Islanders, people in Montauk, people across America view this uh, increasingly a whole time. That's, that's an excellent question. Um, and um, I'm in my sixth term, by the way. Um, <laughs> Here's what I've learned. I've learned that the most debilitating emotion that there is when you're trying to govern is anger, okay? And my view is that the Congress has become consumed with anger. No longer do we have respectful disagreements. 
we, the disagreements have become personal. The disagreements uh, mutate into uh, disdain, if not contempt. And it's very difficult to legislate in that kind of environment. I am not a part of that. I am not a person who approaches issues from the vantage point of anger. I, I, anyone who has watched me throughout my entire adult life will tell you that I always am civil, respectful, positive, productive. That's why I've been able to form the partnerships with virtually every elected official that serves in, the, in this district. Um, so but I'll just give you one example of what I bring to the table that is all too often missing. Uh, we have passed, we have only passed, I think, 26 substantive bills in two years in the United States Congress. One of them is something called the Water Resources Development Act, which I was one of four people to write, two Republicans, two Democrats. And we wrote it together and were able to pass it with a huge bipartisan majority because we were willing to do something that has become a four-letter word in Washington. We were willing to compromise. And so we spent the summer of 13, the four of us, going back and forth, saying this is what we can live with, this is what we can't live with, this is what we're willing to give up, but if we give this up, this is what we need in return. By the way, that, that's called is legislating. We did that. So I have a very strong track record of being willing to reach across the aisle, form partnerships with the other side, and get things done. So if you ask what I bring to the table, that's what I bring to the table. It's what I've always brought to the table, but what I will never bring to the table is anger and an absence of civility. Civility, they're debilitating. Yes. Hi, my name's Kara Gray. I just want to ask um, Congressman Bishop, can you talk about the increase in generic drugs over the past year? Um, in particular, some of them are uh, blood pressure medications, cholesterol. Um, the one I use mostly is doxycycline to treat Lyme disease. I'm getting patients coming back with $600, $400. This is a medication we use all the time, acne, Lyme disease, which is rampant out here, out east. Um, could you please just discuss that? There's no question that there's an increased reliance on generic drugs. Uh, I probably shouldn't be so revealing about myself, but I take three medications, uh, and all three are generic. Okay, uh, and I feel that I'm being both A, very well treated by those drugs, and B, uh, they're relatively kind on my, uh, on my wallet. So uh, I think the move to generics uh, is an important move, in my opinion. Uh, it saves people money in the main, and I think one of the things that we've been trying to get a handle on in Congress, and this has been bipartisan, is the extent to which name brand drugs modify something as simple as the packaging so as to keep in place the patent that protects generics from coming into the market. I think that's wrong. So my own view uh, is that the reliance, the increased reliance on generics is good in terms of the economies of healthcare. It's also, to my knowledge, uh, has not resulted in any uh, deleterious impact on people's care. Uh, certainly hasn't in my case, and I don't offer myself as an example. I, I learned a long time ago not to make judgment by anecdote. Uh, but um, but um, my experience of the people we deal with, the people we help, uh, is that generics have been helpful, and uh, I, I think it's a good thing that there are more generics in the marketplace. But is there anything in the horizon to help relieve the cost? They've been doubling and tripling, and I'm finding it very hard to help people with some of these generics. I'm talking $600, $1,000. It's been really over the past year and mostly the past month. Yeah. One of the issues that is prevalent in healthcare uh, is whether or not the federal government should use the power that it has to negotiate better pricing with drug companies. Now, the prescription drug bill, um, Medicare Part D, specifically prohibited that. I think that was a mistake. That was a provision of the bill that was actually written by the pharmaceutical companies. Not exactly a good idea. Um, but um, uh, I think that I mean, the Department of Defense negotiates for better pricing. The Department of Veterans Affairs negotiates for better pricing. Has been doing it for years. I think the Department of Health and Human Services should be allowed to do it as well. That would drive down price because of the the, the ability uh, of the federal government to drive the, the the pricing would drive down price. And I I think that's what we should do. Okay, uh, yeah, this is challenging. Dan Burganti, uh, Congressman Bishop. Since the Affordable Health Care uh, Bill passed, the best advantage plans offered by Empire Blue Cross Blue Shield was their uh, Medi Blue Freedom 3 PPO. That was discontinued. 
we then switch to Freedom 2. That was discontinued. Freedom 1 has continued for the next year, this coming year. The price will increase by 40%. That's premiums and deductibles, not including our co-pays. Back on March 10th, 2010, Nancy Pelosi, the Democrat Speaker of the House, famously said, we have to pass the health care bill. Is there a question coming? Yes, so that you can find out what it is. The President signed it in June 25th, 2010. My question is, how much time did your staff devote to studying this final bill uh, that affects one-sixth of our economy? I know it'll come as a surprise to you, uh, but I read the bill. Uh, and for how, how much time, sir? Well, it was 1,200 pages, so whatever, how long, however long it took me to read it, I read it. Okay? And uh, my health care staff have read it as well. We spent an enormous amount of time um, studying the bill, but we also spent an enormous amount of time talking to doctors, other health care providers, hospital administrators, nurses, patients, insurance companies. We did an enormous amount of due diligence with respect to that bill. Now, you probably think I arrived at the wrong judgment. That's fair, that's life in a democracy. Uh, but my judgment was that this was a bill that moved this country forward, and let me be specific. Right now, there are 13 million people in this country who have insurance who a year ago didn't have it. That's a good thing, these are our fellow citizens. A million of them are in New York, our fellow New Yorkers. If you are under the age of 26, you, you can stay on your parents' policy. Insurance company can no longer cancel a policy simply because you have the poor sense to get sick. Uh, women no longer are subjected to having rates that are 8, 10, 12 times higher because being a woman is a pre-existing condition. That's a good thing. A family, I'm telling you the truth, as a, a family that has a child with, an as, with asthma can now buy a plan. That's a good thing. Hospitals have saved $5.5 billion in unreimbursed care. That's a good thing. Seniors have saved almost $12 billion in, in, in prescription drug costs. That's a good thing. So there are good things about this bill. There are things about this bill that need a lot of work. The problem is that there is no willingness in the Congress on the part of the other side of the aisle to fix that which is not working. We need to keep what is working, and we need to fix that which isn't working. But in answer to your question, I read the bill. I can't tell you how many hours, but it was a ton. Yes, Ms. Lowenstein. Melissa <laughs> Lowenstein Meyer. Um, first off, Congressman, the, the Affordable no Care Act. No relative, but. <laughs> <laughs> the Affordable Care Act saved my husband and I $16,000 a year. So, yes, it does work, and it does work very well for people that own small businesses, especially out here. My question for both candidates is this I'd like to know your stand on why women are not getting paid the same amount of money as men. How come we are making 77 cents on every dollar that a man makes? Will you vote to make it equal or not? Yes or no answer to that and then explain, please, both of you. Yes, and I have twice. Uh, the, uh, up in Albany, their legislation, equal pay for equal work, uh, we helped get passed the New York State Senate. Uh, I voted for it every single time it came up for a vote. Uh, it's something that I, I believe in a lot personally. So it's very easy for me to answer that question, yes, and I have. Um, same here. I have one of the first... Um, First bills that uh, the Democrat uh, majority in the House of Representatives passed in 2007, passed into law, was the Lilly Ledbetter Fair Pay Act, uh, which corrected a serious injustice in terms of how women were paid in the corporate setting. And I'm a co-sponsor of what's called the, uh, the uh, Paycheck Fairness Act, which also would address the inequity, the 77 cents on the dollar that women get paid. So I'm a, the father of uh, two adult daughters. I am a staunch supporter of equal pay for equal work. Uh, yes. My name is Jerry Kane, and uh, Congressman, you and I have something in common. You mentioned the fact that you have a historical background in teaching and so on, and I do too. I was selected in uh, 1988, uh, Teacher of the Year in the State of New York, to uh, go to all, uh, go to Washington and represent Long Island. After having said that. After having said that, I would like to get a little bit lower. 
Uh, I've never heard of an adequate explanation for your participation two years ago in taking a, what they call in here, a bribe to get a piece of legislation there. Not a piece of legislation, but to violate the Clovens. Okay, you know exactly, I what, know you're exactly what you're talking about. But I'm sorry? I thought I know exactly what you're talking about. Okay. Uh, then maybe I don't have to go any further. You, for, for once publicly, and I haven't heard it, you could explain what happened. I have several times that I'd be happy to do it again. Thank, thank you. Uh, I have been accused of, um, of uh, coercing a contribution from a person who asked me uh, to help facilitate a request for a permit so that he could have a fireworks display for his son's bar mitzvah. Um, the permit, the reason he needed an expedition of the permit was because the fireworks company, Fireworks by Grucci, was supposed to ask for the permit 180 days in front before the show. They didn't ask for it until 60 days before the show. And so they came to me and asked if I could expedite the permit, which I did by virtue of simply asking the agencies that were involved, the Corps of Engineers, Fish and Wildlife Service, Southampton Town Trustees, and I believe there was one other day, New York State DEC, to just move the application to the top of the pile. I did not, under any circumstances, intercede with any of those agencies to seek a particular outcome. I simply said, move it to the top of the pile. And by the way, I would refer you uh, to this ample information on this topic uh, and there is uh, it, that's available on the uh, um, House Ethics Committee website I would urge you to look at it uh, but there is not one single word of testimony from anyone that I coerced either the agencies involved to um, to come to a particular conclusion nor is there a single word of testimony from anyone that I coerced a contribution from the individual that I helped the situation you're referring to has been the subject of a 21-month federal Department of Justice investigation, and I have been cleared. These are false, politically motivated allegations, and I'm thankful that the Department of Justice has cleared me. Yes. Um, somebody who hasn't asked. Yes, uh, gentlemen, lady. Yeah. Yes, Laura. Uh, I'm Laura Stein, and I just wanted to say I'm not one of the 17,000 people, constituents who called Tim's office with a problem because my problem was more amorphous. So I'm in addition to those, and I'm one of thousands more, I'm sure, where it wasn't a specific thing, but I was seeking guidance. I knew no one. I was not, at the time, it was a financial problem. I was not a prospect for any kind of big donation or even moderate donation. Um, and I received the kind of help that the constituent in this case received, and that anybody I have spoken to who has ever contacted that office received. It was amazing. Question? Um, a question. question. We so need a question. I have a question. <laughs> well, I'm sorry. Uh, OK, you want the second question? Yeah. Um, <laughs> First, if you are elected, will you go along with the majority to repeal the Davis-Bacon Act and to uh, do away with the uh, National Labor Relations Board? I think the key with the National Labor Relations Board is that uh, the appointments that uh, need to be made to the, the board need to be fair to both employer and employee. That's the key. So you get one administration after another, uh, and you are getting different philosophical, ideological appointments to, uh, to the board. Um, any proposal to modify something like Davis-Bacon, it really would depend on what the specific proposal is of what you want to modify to Davis-Bacon or any other piece of uh, federal statute. So repeal, repeal. I, I, you know, I repeal the Davis-Bacon Act. No, I, I don't think that, um, that that's necessarily something that, uh, that, that I would be advocating for. Um, you know, every state's different. I mean, you have some states that are uh, right-to-work states. Others, um, like, New York, like New York State, uh, that's have... national law. No, I understand that. I'm just saying, uh, you know, that, that uh, on a state-by-state -state basis, there's very different um, uh, rules 
regulations, laws with regards to union, non-union. Um, and I think the federal, um, the federal role in that should the, the footprint should be uh, minimized in terms of you know, telling a state like New York uh, that they need to move more in one direction or moving another state that is you know, diametrically opposed to us, uh, forcing them to move uh, their rules a lot. I'm a, a big states rights guy and I think that it's very important that when you go from you know, Republican administration, Democratic administration, liberals, moderates, conservatives, that there's a little bit more consistency and that, and I'm glad you asked about the NLRB because that's a great example of uh, an area where there's inconsistency. And, uh, and one alibi from before, I, uh, I, 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 when I was talking earlier about the effort with the saltwater fishing license fee, I, I guess if I was sitting next to Fred Thiel, I would have, uh, uh, I would have been able to remind myself, but uh, that actually it was a Sunman Thiel who carried the, uh, the legislation in the assembly. So we would not have been able to get it done if we didn't partner on that. So I just wanted to mention that because uh, he, was, uh, he, he was our, our partner in that effort carrying the, uh, the weight in the state assembly. So thank you, Assembly Thiel. Sorry about that. Okay. And the gentleman in a tie. Uh, <laughs> can all stand up. Uh, Jeremy Samuelson, I, I actually serve as the executive director for Concerned Citizens of Montauk. So thank you all of you for being here today. I, I really appreciate your, your time. Um, Senator Zeldin, I, I want to ask you a question. One of the issues that uh, our organization has worked on a lot over the last couple of years is trying to establish what is an appropriate coastal policy for our community. And so, you know, we're, we're obviously very vulnerable. Uh, you know, we're, we're a low-lying community. Uh, in, in some instances, uh, you know, we, we've historically made decisions to put things, uh, you know, a little too close to the water and then, you know, erosion has come in and so now they're even closer to the water. And so we have some really difficult decisions to make, and some of those are short-term decisions, and some of those are long-term decisions. But uh, you know, given that we have the federal uh, project that uh, is you know, slated to begin development in our community over this winter, uh, and then the longer-term Fire Island to Montauk Point, I wanted to ask you to just talk to us about uh, you know what your guidance would be to our community. What what is the advice that you would give us in terms of sensible coastal policy? And, and just to put it. Very specifically, we have difficult decisions to make about balancing uh, the rights of existing property owners who are along the coastline. How do we balance those rights of those property owners with the, the need to keep costs down and doing things like building federal projects? There's a little bit of a dynamic tension there, and I'm hoping you've had a chance to do some thinking about what your position would be relative to our community. I appreciate the question, and, and obviously there are uh, two different primary components of analyzing a situation like what we see in Montauk. One is to study it, and then the second is to execute. And one of my pet peeves up in Albany is when things get studied to death. Sometimes things get studied again and again and again and again, and we all know what it's going to say, but it allows an elected official to, to come back and say, we're making progress. Um, as far as Montauk goes, we've reached the point where we need to see millions of cubic square yards of sand to rebuild and protect our coastline. But what's happened is what, you know, the hopes would come up for residents here uh, in Montauk, that the federal government is, you know, we've reached that second part of the process. We've studied it. Now it's time to execute. We see the federal government passing $60 billion of San Diego. We watch as huge dunes get placed on Jones Beach and new roads. We watch as money flows into Staten Island and Queens and Brooklyn and Jersey. We go visit the Jersey Shore this summer and we see that parts of the Jersey Shore look better than they were before. With regards to Montauk, now is the time not to say, you know, what, whatever our best excuse was as to why it hasn't happened yet. And the answer isn't to study it more. It's the time to say, show us our sand. <laughs> We've studied it. We know what the solution is. Our expectations have rose. And now they have been greatly reduced by saying that we may get tens of thousands of cubic square yards of sand. That's not the answer. As far as property uh, rights go, uh, I'm someone who... Um, I, I do not, I, I, I hate it when I watch 
uh, government in too many cases infringing on the rights of, of uh, property owners, uh, especially when, when assessing the economic impact of it, um, that property owners are paid uh, at times the value of their property before any type of rezoning or increase to the value of their property, which is even more insulting. Or when there are negotiations taking place as far as property owners, and they're not even part of the negotiations. At the end of the day though, we have to greatly respect the fact that government doesn't own that property, those individuals do, and one of the greatest things about living in the United States of America is to be able to get your little corner, of your little piece of America, and not worry about government coming and taking it. But as far as the coastal erosions go, uh, erosion issue goes, uh, we've passed the point of studying. The hopes are for people who live here um, that during maybe the next term, uh, the next two years, that we'll actually see this coastline built to the expectations of the people who live here. Uh, yeah, the gentleman, yes. <laughs> yeah, no, the, the yeah. me guy. My name is Reg Cornelius. The, um, the uh, chaos on the border has been uh, kicked off the front page by uh, the Ebola crisis, but it's still going on down there. And uh, I would like to ask, if the president is threatening to uh, issue an amnesty, an executive order promoting amnesty after the election. And I'm wondering if the, the two gentlemen would give us their opinion. Which, which, would you support that amnesty? Or would you recognize that closing the border, controlling, controlling the border is the most important factor before you can talk about a, a, an amnesty which would lead to only more uh, illegal immigration? I'll go first. Okay. Um, I, I very much hope that the president does not uh, handle immigration by way of executive order. Uh, this is a, um, a highly contentious, highly emotional issue that I think would be complicated by a solution that doesn't go through the legislative process. So my hope uh, is that we can move the Congress. Now the Senate has already dealt with comprehensive immigration reform. The House of Representatives, the majority leadership in the House of Representatives refuses to deal with it. I think that's deeply unfortunate. Uh, but um, the comprehensive reform that is out there, some have characterized it as amnesty, it's not. Uh, and some have said that it doesn't sufficiently protect the border, it does. Uh, there is the first provision of the law, uh, or pardon me, the proposed law, uh, is uh, investing hundreds of billions of dollars over the next 10 years in continuing to harden our border. We have more than doubled in the 12 years that I've been in Congress uh, the number of border protection agents. We have built several hundred.